Welcome back to our overview of the regulation of body water and electrolytes. We are on the last recording uh, for today, and we are at about uh, page 306, 307 in your textbook and slide 17 in your outline. The body has many uh, mechanisms in place to regulate uh, water and its uh, flow uh, throughout the body and um, maintenance of blood pressure, maintenance of urine output. And so we'll talk about some of those. The first organ uh, structure that we're going to talk about is the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus is found in the brain. It is adjacent to the pituitary gland. As you can see in figure 1710 in your textbook, at the very top, the hypothalamus is an area of the brain that lies directly, basically in contact with the pituitary gland. You will have an entire chapter uh, in MedSearch 2 um, that is dedicated to the endocrine system where you will revisit the function of the hypothalamus, the pituitary, as well as uh, adrenal glands, thyroid, and the rest of the adrenal, uh, excuse me, the endocrine system. But for today's purpose, we're going to talk about the hypothalamus and how it regulates body water. The hypothalamus uh, has little uh, detectors in it called osmoreceptors that sense um, fluid uh, deficit in the body, which would result in an increased plasma osmolality. Increased plasma osmolality can also be known as increased plasma concentration. And this would be from uh, not taking in enough water or losing too much water. This uh, increase in the uh, plasma's concentration then would stimulate the thirst area in the hypothalamus and would send a messenger hormone to the pituitary gland, which would stimulate the pituitary gland to release the hormone, antidiuretic hormone, uh, commonly abbreviated ADH. So our sense of thirst then is the uh, primary regulator of us in a conscious person, person uh, taking in water. The um, ADH then stimulates water to be reabsorbed by the kidneys. As you can see in figure 17-8, right next to that other picture there on page 307, um, the um, secretion of antidiuretic hormone, as well as other hormones, results in the reabsorption of sodium and potassium and water. Um, and that then will decrease the plasma's osmolality or concentration. And this mechanism works really well in a conscious person or in a person who has an intact thirst mechanism. But we remember from fundamentals that um, as our clients are aging, um, the sense of thirst is uh, diminished, if not absent. So um, we have to remember that. And so I have the illustration here. I believe this is from your Berman textbook um, with regards to the factors that um, will stimulate thirst. Uh, decreased volume certainly will result at the top in increased osmolality, as we mentioned, and increased blood concentration. Um, then we will stop losing water by various mechanisms, in including uh, saliva, so our mouth will become dry and we will sense thirst. Um, also, your brain will tell you that you're thirsty, so the osmoreceptors will tell you that you're thirsty, not only the fact that your mouth is dry. And then the conscious um, person who is able to access water will take a drink. The pituitary gland, which is under the control of the hypothalamus, uh, is where the antidiuretic hormone is released. 
and antidiuretic hormone then um, responds to, as I said, increased plasma osmolality. It also responds to decreased circulating volume. So uh, figure 17-8 is demonstrating that should the kidneys uh, sense decreased volume, then several other mechanisms will come into play and also including the stimulation of antidiuretic hormone. And we'll talk about renin and uh, aldosterone in a minute. Stress, nausea, nicotine, and morphine also stimulate the release of antidiuretic hormone. And so we remember that our postoperative patients are often on morphine and they are under stress and commonly uh, nauseated. And this may be a factor in low urine output as well. And so these are all reasons to um, try to make our patients as comfortable as possible, um, limit their use of morphine, you know, to uh, a degree that they can stay comfortable, but not receive too much and to relieve their nausea. The adrenal glands are very um, important also in the maintenance of water regulation in the body. The adrenal gland releases hormones that regulate both water and electrolytes. And the adrenal gland is stimulated by the anterior pituitary gland. So where the hypothalamus sends messages to the posterior pituitary that um, stimulates the release of antidiuretic hormone. It also is sending messages to the anterior pituitary gland, which stimulates the release of adrenal corticotropin hormone, ACTH. This messenger hormone, again, uh, is, travels through the bloodstream to the adrenal gland, where it stimulates the adrenal gland to secrete aldosterone and cortisol. This, these, chem, these uh, hormones will cause the kidney to reabsorb sodium and reabsorb potassium. Remember, with sodium comes water. So if it's reabsorbing sodium, it's also reabsorbing the water that the sodium is and chloride is dissolved in. Aldosterone is a mineral low corticoid that has a potent sodium retaining and potassium excreting ability. Uh, and aldosterone is secreted in response to decreased renal perfusion. Now, one thing I want you to um, be aware of is that um, aldosterone effects are often one of the uh, effects of blood pressure medication. So if a blood pressure medication is going to reduce the effect of aldosterone, then it will result in a loss of sodium and potassium in the urine. And um, so when we're looking up our medications to do with blood pressure, we want to also be aware of any medication's effect on the ability to produce aldosterone because some of our antihypertensives are specifically targeted to the production of aldosterone. So again, when we're learning about our medications, we're going to try to tie this information in with it. One of the kidney's jobs is to regulate uh, fluids and electrolyte balance in the body. It's the primary job of the organs of the kidneys. The uh, kidneys are responsible for selective reabsorption of water and electrolytes. And so the glomerulus will filter you know, any excess water and electrolytes into the tubule and it is the job then of the body to reabsorb any water and electrolytes that it needs before the, the liquid urine goes through the tubules and out as urine. And so while the glomerulus filters 
um, most water and electrolytes uh, through the glomerulus and into the renal tubule, almost all of that water and electrolytes are reabsorbed. And it is um, important to remember that. But potassium is very poorly um, controlled and reabsorbed. And so, um, you know, if potassium ends up in the um, tubule, very little of it is reabsorbed. And so if medications promote the excretion of potassium, we often have to supplement the uh, intake of potassium, as you, you recall. Um, excretion of electrolytes occurs uh, in the renal tubules, and also renal tubules are under the effects of ADH and aldosterone. And so the efficiency of the kidneys is phenomenal and um, all of the fluid that is being uh, filtered by the glomeruli, multi, you know, millions of glomerulus, uh, results in us only excreting between one and two liters of urine per day. This is a very important role of the kidneys. Um, And so we have a nice, um, the same picture then um, that I've been referring to, um, showing the effect of and the sensitivity of the kidneys to our plasma volume. And so should our volume drop for whatever reason, let's say we are not taking in fluids orally or perhaps we are losing blood um, in some way and our volume is dropping, our kidneys are very, very sensitive to that. And um, the kidneys then sense a dropping of blood volume. And the way they do that is by sensing a dropping of blood pressure. So the kidneys don't really measure the amount of volume in the blood vessels, but what they do measure is the blood pressure. What is the pressure that is being exerted on the um, vascular structures in the kidney. Should that pressure that's being exerted uh, drop, then the kidneys will excrete and produce renin. And renin then is that uh, chemical that causes the conversion of um, uh, angiotensin one and angiotensin two into uh, large amounts of angiotensin two, which cause an increase in blood pressure. Angiotensin II is a potent vasoconstrictor. It also will um, try to um, hold on to um, sodium, as you can see at the bottom. Renin causes the production of aldosterone and secretion of aldosterone by the adrenal glands. Um, also, the other things that cause the production of aldosterone, as you can see, are stress and physical trauma, increases the production of ACTH, which stimulates the adrenal gland. Low serum sodium also stimulates aldosterone production, and high serum potassium will stimulate aldosterone production. Then we will have a reabsorption of sodium and an increased excretion of potassium. I got this uh, picture from um, a conference that I went to many years ago, and I liked um, the visual of seeing the top there, all of the uh, elements that flow into the glomerulus, into the through the blood uh, that are filtered through the glomerulus. And so, you know, water, glucose, urea, calcium, potassium, sodium, chloride, all flow into the glomerulus through the bloodstream and are filtered into the filtrate that goes down in the tubule there. And you can see that we selectively reabsorb almost all of those elements, glucose, amino acids, potassium, calcium, water, water, water. And then sort of as the filtrate moves through the renal tubule, water and sodium continue to be exchanged back and forth based on the effects of 
various hormones, aldosterone and renin among them. And the end result then finally, and the concentration phase is where, um, you know, depending upon the influence of these hormones, different amounts of water are reabsorbed or are kept in the urine, and then the amount of urine is produced. And I like this picture, so I included it here for you as a visual. The heart is also involved in the regulation of water in the body, and we have two hormone, or we have two hormones, and one that we measure in the hospital uh, that are produced by the right atria, and it is called uh, atrial natriuretic peptide, and um, the right atria particularly because it responds uh, very quickly to increases in pressure. Now, remember, on the right side of the heart, it's supposed to be a low pressure system. It's the venous side of the heart. And so when the right atria senses stretching and extension or uh, overfilling uh, due to a fluid volume um, imbalance, a fluid volume increase uh, or overload, the atria stretches and produces these uh, two hormones, atrial natriuretic peptide and B-type natriuretic peptide, BNP. And they are actually released by the walls of the atria uh, if they are stretched and they sense increased pressure. This BNP is measurable in the hospital and it is often measured and used as an indicator of a person who is in heart failure uh, congestive heart failure and what their status is. So when you have your patients this semester that may have some fluid volume excess and perhaps congestive heart failure, look for this BNP level and look for it to be high on admission. And as the patient is treated with diuretics to reduce the, the amount of excess fluid in their body, that level should drop and it is an indicator of how stretched out is that right atria. This hormone um, stimulates vasodilation and increases urinary excretion of sodium and water. The GI system accounts for um, the way that we uh, take in most of our water, two to three liters a day of water are taken in and very small amounts of water are eliminated by the GI tract in feces, only about 100 milliliter. And so the GI system is very efficient in absorbing almost all of the water that we uh, ingest, and this is under normal circumstances. Of course, we have to remember that should the patient not be taking in fluid uh, or have a diarrhea situation, where they are losing vast amounts of feces and water in the feces, we're going to disturb this balance, this mechanism that is usually so efficient. We also want to remember that from our skin, we have water loss in the form of sensible water loss, which is sweat, and insensible water loss, which is water. So Sweat, which is visible and sort of measurable when we see a lot of sweat, we um, can observe that visually. When we sweat, we lose water and electrolytes, and usually in a pretty balanced way. But the risk with insensible water loss is that no electrolytes are lost with insensible water loss. It is all water. And this is water that is lost uh, via the respiratory system and the skin, and it is not measurable and it is not visible. Um, and so we have to remember that should there be any change in the rate of loss through the skin, which is normally 600 to 900 milliliters a day. So it's a pretty significant amount of loss of water almost a liter of water a day is lost through our respiratory system and our skin. But let's say that our patient's respiratory rate is increased from you know, the normal um, 12 to 16 breaths a minute 
you know, and they're breathing at 40 breaths a minute. So that is going to significantly increase their insensible water loss and make them prone for fluid volume deficit or dehydration. Also, should the patient be in a dry, uh, hot environment that's going to increase their insensible water loss uh, through their skin and through their respiratory system. So we want to uh, remember that um, we can lose a lot of fluid through our respiratory system and insensible water loss, which is very difficult to measure. And finally, um, some effects of aging on the regulation of water, and this is found on page 308. Um, when we, uh, as we grow older, we've already mentioned the changes with our thirst mechanisms. We also have changes with our functioning of our uh, kidneys. We have decreased glomerular filtration rate, uh, GFR. We have a decrease in the renal blood flow. Uh, therefore, um, the kidneys are just not going to be as efficient as they are in younger life. Creatinine clearance is reduced and the ability to concentrate urine is reduced. Changes in the production of ADH, renin, and aldosterone occur, and we have an increased loss of insensible water due to the thinning of the epidermis and decreased fat layer uh, found in our skin. For all of these reasons, the older adult as, is more at risk for variations in their um, water balance. And so while a healthy 80 year old has, you know, normal um, BUN and creatinine and normal chemistry values. Should that 80 year old become ill, be dehydrated, have a fever, um, have a blood loss, or have a, a problems with fluid intake, then they are not as readily able to adjust to those changes. And we need to be aware of that as nurses. We have to remember to assess our patients of various ages, especially the old and the young. We need to remember about our patients, older patients, changes in their thirst mechanisms and offer them fluids. We need to remember about our patients who have had a disruption in the mechanism, such as the abdominal cavity, which may affect third spacing. Organ failures, as such as this gentleman in the right upper corner, a heart failure, a liver failure, or kidney failure will also affect the balance of water in the body. We will discuss in class the assessment strategies that nurses will employ um, after we talk about alterations in electrolytes. Um, so if you have any questions with relation to this content, please don't hesitate to post your questions on the discussion board on Blackboard. I will share all questions and responses with both sections. Uh, so if one section comes up with a really important question, I'll definitely post it on the other section's Blackboard um, discussion site. Bring your most pressing questions to class. We're going to be doing an activity with them. So just write them on a piece of paper and fold them up. We're going to be using them um, to promote discussion at the beginning of our class session next week. And of course, you can always email me um, if you have questions. And I look forward to seeing you next week and I look forward to having feedback about this strategy of taping the PowerPoint. Have a great day and enjoy the snow.